some way of getting insulin from the very first time they're diagnosed. The majority of people, however, will develop type 2 diabetes. Now, that, that adult onset or, or uh, type 2 diabetes is usually what happens is your body becomes increasingly resistant to the insulin that you create. Normally what's supposed to happen is you eat food and you eat um, something with sugar or, or flour or you know, something with one of the carbohydrates and it increases the amount of sugar circulating through your, through your uh, bloodstream. Then it requires this hormone called the insulin to take that sugar and tell the cells of the body to, to put it inside, to take it inside the muscle cells or the fat cells or all the different cells of the body. If you don't have enough insulin, or if your body stops responding to insulin, then it's called diabetes. So in the, in the case of that type 2 diabetes, a person becomes increasingly resistant to, di to, the, to the insulin that they, that they have. So even if they make a normal amount, their body's no longer able to use it. So what happens is the, the, the amount of sugar circulating through the bloodstream, instead of being a normal number like 100 or 120, Suddenly, you'll see people with a sugar level in their bloodstream that will be 300 or 400 or even higher. And that, that occurs because they're no longer able to have the insulin help take that, that sugar to the inside. Well, what causes diabetes? That's a common thing you might have wondered, or you might have a family member that will wonder, what, what did I do to get this disease? I didn't want that. <laughs> but it's become increasingly common because I think our diet has changed. We, we consume more food than you know, maybe than previous generations of people, and also we, we consume a lot of um, a lot of carbohydrates, we, a lot of things made with corn and, and wheat and, uh, and flour and sugar, and, and I think the prevalence of soda pop and, and candy and cake and you know the sweets has increased. So that's one factor. Uh, I think also if you look around the types of jobs that you you used to see people had to you know people did a lot of very physical manual labor you know, with, with their employment. And now a lot of people spend a lot of, a lot of time being uh, sedentary, doing, uh, doing things that require the use of a computer, or they are, they're doing things that don't require their body to be very physically active. So I think that's why we see a lot more of it. And you're actually seeing some of those, some people that experience enough um, obesity and overweight uh, symptoms, even, even as, as kids, you know, like in their late teenage years, we're having some people diagnosed with adult type on, uh, onset diabetes because they're, they're, they've become so overweight even at those young ages. Well, how do you prevent it? Well, the main thing is if you have a family history of diabetes or, or you're kind of prone to get it, the main thing is just try to be active. Try to be out. The, the recommendation is 30 minutes of, of uh, kind of moderate level activity at least five days a week. That could be walking or jogging or, or hiking or, or even, even any, basically any activity that gets your heart rate up and, and keeps it up and sustained for about 30 minutes would, would really help. If a person would get in the habit of doing that about five days a week, that, that helps prevent it. And if you do have diabetes, that helps make it a whole lot easier to control if you can be active. The other thing is, whether it's for yourself or maybe for one of your grandkids, try to teach those habits early on. It, the studies have shown that kids who graduate from high school being overweight or obese um, are you know, extremely likely to remain overweight and obese as an adult, and that they are very likely to go on and get diabetes. So what you can do is teach your, teach your grandkids and, and your, your kids and family members that you might have that um, to be active makes a difference. And so when we choose an activity, are we going to play, stay home and play video games, or are we going to go out on a hike and go, go camping? Well, we're trying to teach them to be outside. We live in a beautiful part of the country where we can go outside and do lots of outdoor activities and everything from um, snowshoeing and, and you know, uh, winter activities like skiing that a lot of the, the younger folks enjoy. Or, or in the summertime, there's lots of hiking and, and hunting and different things. Out. And the, the goal is to just be active and be outside. The other thing that, that we can all adopt for ourselves or for our family members is to try to uh, try to teach people how to eat correctly. We, I think a lot of us, I, I know I've been tempted to do this, and we probably all have one when I'm worried about stuff or, or you know, stressed or concerned about things, I want to eat, you know, because it, it, bring, it brings me comfort, you know, and I think we all experience that. We need to learn that instead of, instead of eating to, to comfort ourselves, we should probably um, exercise. That, that's the thing that's been shown to help the very most, is trying to say, well, I'm kind of worried about stuff, I'm going to go on a walk, or I'm going to go take a little break and get outside. 
But if we teach our kids and grandkids that same principle, that we don't eat ourselves, we, or we don't eat, we don't eat to comfort ourselves. And if we teach people to say, well, we, we get exercise and we try to get out and get some fresh air and get and, and get, get that exercise and, and not not fill ourselves full of junk food, that that helps. Um, there are a lot of things that can be done about diabetes. There's medications, a lot of pills that can be used, or, or there's injections. But whether whether or not somebody requires medication or not, it, it really does make a very big difference if someone's active, living an active, healthy lifestyle. That not only prevents the disease, but helps people be helps it be easier to control. Um, so I, I guess that's the message about diabetes. If, if if you have it, or if you know someone that has it, try to be active, and eat, eat as healthy as you can. If you have family members that that you're worried might get it, encourage them to be active and be outside doing stuff. You know, like I said, at least 30 minutes, five days a week, um, and, and that makes a big difference. You wonder who might need to be screened for diabetes. And say, well, maybe I'm at risk. Should I go get blood tests? And should I be doing something about it? Well, if if you, if you know someone that's that's at high risk because they have a family history of it, or because they're overweight, or, or things like that, that person ought to be getting a, a blood test to screen for diabetes probably about every three years. There's a, a blood test called the hemoglobin A1C that can be used as a screening test. And insurance companies should cover the cost of that um, if a person will just get it. There's everything from the uh, locally we have the hospital that does health fair labs or or, or or if your physician orders the labs, usually they are covered without cost because it's considered a preventative screening test. So, anyway, diabetes, it's kind of this thing that is becoming commonplace. It used to be it used to be when somebody was diagnosed with diabetes, they got sent to a specialist somewhere, and they had to be, they had to really be worked up because it was so uncommon. Now it's a, it's becoming extremely common, and so all all of the family physicians and internal medicine physicians are trained on, on treating diabetes, and, and it's you know the, the, the treatments are becoming much easier to to use, and there's a lot of research that's going on to try to help prevent that from being becoming worse, and trying to help the next generation of of these young kids that are graduating from high school and whatnot to hopefully be a little more active and do things to prevent um, the onset of diabetes. I guess that's that's all I've got. Julia, then, um, if, 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 does anybody have any questions for the main group here? What are you considered? 21 years old, like one or twenty. So it's it's less based on age and more based on how it's presented. Can you repeat your question? Now she asked, if you're 21 years old, is it type one or type two? If that's if that's when you were diagnosed, it very much depends on. Me, but I have a niece. Yeah. She went home away. Right. So a lot of times, for a younger adult, if they got diabetes and it was at a pretty young age and they weren't overweight, a lot of times they did they had some destruction of their cells that produced insulin. But that's you, you kind of have to depend depends on the lab tests that are done at the time of diagnosis. Also, if somebody finds themselves immediately dependent on insulin from such a young age, a lot of times it is more of a type one case. Okay. I, I think the big message is the type one diabetes rates haven't really changed much, but that type two insulin resistance where people are overweight and they get diabetes that that has skyrocketed. You know, like it, I mean, just the amount that used to be present in the uh, you know, even 40 or 50 years ago compared to now, it's just dramatically different. So we can do a good job as, as, uh, a, you know, as, as parents and grandparents to help teach this upcoming generation how to avoid it. Right, that's an insulin pump. Those, those were pretty handy. Yeah. Does anybody else have any other uh, questions for, for the general group? If not, I'll, I'll hang out here for a few minutes if anybody has any uh, questions about the disease, I'd be more than happy to, to answer them. Okay, thank you. We'll just have them sit right here, so if you guys have any one-on-one -on -one stuff,